This is episode 70 with Awilda Rivera. Welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, the show that empowers you to become the hero of your life's journey. With your host, Brian Tier. Hey guys and girls, welcome back to another episode of the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast. Episode 70 today, and I'm really excited to be speaking to Awilda Rivera. Now, before we get on to the show, we have a new sponsor today, and that is Optimize. And in case you haven't heard of it, Optimize is pretty much the best $10 a month that I spend. It was created by modern-day philosopher Brian Johnson, who created what's known as Philosopher's Notes. Now, basically, these are six-page PDFs or 20-minute MP3s of the greatest personal development books ever written. And uh, Brian has written, uh, read those, distilled the wisdom into 10 big ideas, and shared them with you for as little as $10 a month. There's so much more like masterclasses and interviews with the authors, but I'll let you check that out, and you can see it at briantier.com slash optimize. Right, let's get on to the show today, and Awilda Rivera is a success coach, a yogi, and spiritual advisor who began her career studying law. But in her late 20s, Awilda experienced a reawakening that opened her eyes to the startling reality that the people all around her, herself included, were yearning for something more. She realized that she wanted more money, freedom, and direction, and she wanted to know that she was making an impact in people's lives. Ultimately, she wanted to be successful, and she wanted to help others be successful too. At a young age, Awilda understood the importance of giving back and being a resource to those in need. And now her mission is to provide others with the tools and support they need to experience the success they desire right now. In this episode, you're going to learn how to balance your time between multiple responsibilities. You're going to learn how to create boundaries to achieve your goals faster. You'll hear the most dangerous thing you can do when starting your own business. What to do before creating a business plan. Three common pitfalls when becoming an entrepreneur and how to avoid them. And you're going to learn how to use small-scale projects for large-scale growth. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantier.com slash 070. But for now, let's go hang out with the Wilder. Welcome back, everyone, and a big welcome to today's guest. I'm excited to be speaking to Awilda Rivera. Awilda, welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you reached out because, uh, so for people listening, Awilda sent me an email and said she really thinks she could add a lot to, to you guys listening. And I checked out your site and, you know, the email you sent me, and it looks really cool, and I'm really excited. Uh, but for people who don't know, you know, who and what it is that you do, why don't you tell us a bit about your quarter life story? Of course, uh, my quarter life story actually um, got kicked off by finding myself in a hospital bed um, at the age of 27 uh, in a cardiac wing of Jersey City Medical Center after having a mild obvious cardiac episode um, as I was finishing up my clerkship for a judge in the family court um, department of the Hudson vicinage. So basically, um, I went to law school. I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was little and just sort of plugged through, kept my head down and was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Graduated during the recession. During law school, started to feel like probably maybe I don't want to do this, but uh, as long as I can still be a criminal lawyer, that'll be fine. You know, like it'll be fine. I had some sort of law and order, special victims unit, idealized vision of what I thought the process of becoming a criminal lawyer was going to be. Um, and then when I realized that I would have to be a prosecutor first, and this is nothing against prosecutors. There are some really good ones out there. But um, the interviews that I went to made me feel like I was going to have to presume a level of guilt in people in such a way that it just I just didn't feel comfortable with that. And I very quickly realized that, man, if I don't become a prosecutor, I'm probably not going to be able to become a defense attorney. And I probably just don't want to be a lawyer anymore. Um 
but that was too hard of a realization to just sort of speak out. So I was like, you know what? I'll just try to do something else in the law. Maybe I'll clerk. Maybe I'll go in-house. I don't know. So I clerked for a year. It was very, very hard. Um, Not hard in terms of the work, but the nature of the work was very sad. You know, I was working in a family court where they were removing children from, you know, homes because of alleged abuse and or other scenarios. And so I'm, you know, we were seeing people at, at their worst, unfortunately, and children in peril. It was, it was a lot. Um, and so, you know, obviously the universe was trying to tell me something that I wasn't listening to. And the only way that I could listen was by, you know, to use a Latin phrase from ancient times, being laid low. So I was laid low by this cardiac episode. I had to spend an overnight at the hospital. And when I basically woke up the next day, I was like, something has to change. Um, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to be happy. Um, I got to get real with myself, get over the sort of whatever mental block I have about, oh, I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. And this is what I've been saying for 20 years and figure out what I am going to be and get after it. Yeah, I, it, it's so cool. It's it reminds me of the Euro's journey where, you know, you had your cardiac episode. It was kind of like the wake up call. Um, for you to pursue something that you're being called to pursue. And I also want to acknowledge and kind of shine lights on what you said is that, you know, you said when you were small, you, you wanted to be a lawyer, and then you went that route. And, um, you know, it, it can be really hard to have that realization that, you know, maybe this isn't actually what I wanted to do. And I know for people listening, that'll, that'll resonate really strongly, because uh, for a lot of people in, in this audience, like, they would have wanted to do the thing that they're doing at the moment from when they were younger. Um, and now they might be realizing like, hang on a second, this isn't actually what I'd pictured. Like these TV shows painted it out to be so, so exciting. And um, it's just not what I'm experiencing, but it can be hard to kind of step out of that because it's, you know, it's safe to stay, to stay what uh, doing what we're doing. So I just want to acknowledge you for, for kind of taking a, uh, a step out of that. Um, Something that you mentioned on your website is that, and I quote, professional and personal development can lead to sustainable financial growth as long as one maintains personal balance. And you've, you've got a lot of responsibilities on your plate, being a stepmom and a president of a, non, uh, a yoga nonprofit and, um, you know, a coach. And I wanted to find out, like, what did you mean by, by that sense of personal balance? And um, yeah. how, how do you balance your time with all those different res responsibilities? Yeah, well, I mean, recently, actually, I just finished my tenure as the board president, um, but I've actually, uh, no rest for the weary, I've actually identified another nonprofit that I'm going to be <laughs> working with and have started to really dive into meeting with some of their board members and getting involved with them in another thing that I'm passionate about, uh, squash the game of squash and, and, and academic enrichment of, of young kids. Um, but first of all, I think the key of that is sustainable um, because, and I know you're, you're in Canada. Uh, I'm actually in South Africa. Oh, in South Africa. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that Americans particularly battle with is this sort of overachievement mentality. Like I got to do it all and I got to do it all on my own. Um, and what I've found is, is that that is the quickest way to burn out. And if you're burned out, you can't really do anything. You can't be effective. You can't be a good, you can't be a good partner. You can't be a good business owner. You can't do any of those things. So for me, the personal balance comes from being able to create boundaries. That's a lot of what I work with my clients on creating boundaries and creating expectations around what is actually your ability in terms of productivity and um, accountability, right? So if you only have two hours free per week, right? Let's say it's someone who's younger and they have a full-time job, but they also are looking to create their own business, but they only have two hours free a week. It would be very challenging for you to try to get eight hours worth of work done in that two hours. You have to first step back and say, okay, well, what's sustainable, right? I could probably chunk all that down 
to a few things and very systematically accomplish that over a month, right? Um, or over two months. But if I try to do that in two weeks, it's probably not going to work. So for me, personal balance looks like, A, looking at what I actually have to accomplish in order to make money. So what are my client responsibilities? What is my administrative stuff around my website or the next international trip that I'm planning for the yoga aspect of the business? What do, what do I need to get done with that? And then also, like, what does a Wilda need to feel happy? right? A will to, in order to feel happy and not start to feel antsy and distracted, because if I'm antsy and I'm distracted, I can't be very productive. Now, can I? Um, what, what a will to needs is, okay, I need to do yoga at least twice a week, if not every day, um, just for me, not teaching it, but just me doing it for me, whatever I need in my body. And that's going to a studio at least twice a week. A will to needs to play squash, once a week or twice a week, um, because that helps me get out a lot of energy. A wilda needs good sleep. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to catch a wilda walking, working until 2 a.m. Because I know that I don't, I don't function well if I don't have enough sleep. So I'm going to sleep at 1130, midnight at the latest, um, and waking up at 8, 830, and getting my productivity done during the hours where I'm most productive. Um, and so a lot of personal balance, Brian, I believe is about self-awareness, knowing what do I actually need to do and what do I actually need to function and then reconciling the two based on the time you have available. Mm -hmm. And if you do that successfully, I have seen in my clients and in myself that you're able to create a new homeostasis where you're able to not just accomplish the things that you set out to accomplish, but accomplish them successfully and less time than you suspect and to get greater rewards from them. Yeah. I love this idea of using boundaries like kind of as business tools. Um, and I, I think it's a big one that self-employed people struggle with is that, uh, you know, especially if they have a full-time job and they're trying to, build a side gig after hours is they could feel guilty for taking time out to go to gym or you know that kind of thing when actually like that's probably one of your most important moves is to make sure your body's taken care of uh, because you're eventually going to burn out it's not a like you mentioned it's not a sustainable option um i i want to go back to when you eventually shifted out of the law um industry and what it was like becoming your own boss and, you know, some things about that that people maybe aren't aware of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, becoming your own boss, I think, is like the best thing, but also can be the scariest thing, um, especially if you don't have anyone around you that has modeled that behavior before. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's like uh, it's like trying to be a dad if your dad wasn't around like you could work really hard at it but it might be harder than the guy who had like the awesome dad that took him to little league every day you know mm -hmm. so i would say that the the most important thing that i didn't know when i first became my own boss that i needed to have a mental shift around was task management and not just task management from a day-to-day -day basis, but from like a week-to-week -week basis. Like, okay, I need to plan my entire week. I need to look at this from a macro and then do the micro because I'm the only one, you know, initially, you know, you're the only one managing everything. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing from task management is what is my growth projection? Like, what am I doing? I'm not just... You know, we sometimes invent, excuse me, we sometimes venture into the entrepreneurial world and say, I just want to have my own business. So we take a bunch of darts and we just start throwing them at the wall and we just try to see what sticks. I would say that is probably the most dangerous thing you can do simply because you're playing Russian roulette with your resources, with your energy and with your time. Because the worst thing that can happen to you is that you do that. You end up getting fatigued mentally. You use all your resources and then you're like, oh, this just doesn't work. And then you end up having to go back to work for someone because you're like, this is just not going to work out for me. Now, 
creating a strategic plan is of course easier said than done but i would say that the best way to start with that and this is going to sound very cliche and very old school but trying to have some kind of a business plan is really important and i know you guys are probably like oh my god i'm a millennial why the hell do i need a business plan but it's like you need to have you need to know where you're going. When people build a house, they're not like, "Oh yeah, it's going to just be a Tudor house just and then they send the contractor to just do what they feel." No. You have a blueprint. You have a schematic. You're you're looking at the best materials. You're making sure it comes out exactly how you want. Why wouldn't you treat your business with the same amount of detail orientation and making sure that it's coming out the way you want it, right? Now, of course, the great thing about a business plan that scares most millennials, and I will admit scared me, is that you think, oh, my God, my business plan is like the Bible. Like, I cannot change anything. If anything is different from this, like, I have screwed up. Like, oh, my God. That's what most millennials think when you think business plan. You think, oh, my God, now I am stuck and I am married to this thing. And we know Millennials, we don't like being married to things. We don't like being like super committed because we feel like it it robs us from being able to be like passionate about everything and like being able to do anything that we want. And the truth is, is that the sooner you're able to narrow your focus to say, okay, well, I'm ready to focus on this thing, the easier it is for you to be passionate about more things because you have a clear idea of what you're doing in one area. Mm -hmm. So you're able to then build out the other areas. You know, if you don't have a clear focus of what you're going to do, then it's going to be really hard for you to make any kind of substantial progress. Yeah. I love how uh, John Lee Dumas describes focus as follow one course until success. And then you build out the next thing. So mm -hmm. I, I want to, um, you know, expose this business plan a little bit. Is this kind of a, a vision for what we want to create or is it more detailed than that? Um, it's more detailed for that. It's, it's not sort of a stream of consciousness that I think can also be helpful. I think there's something called a belief narrative that I do with some of my clients. And that's where I think, especially people listening to this who found themselves in sort of their quarter life comeback, I think that's a good place to start before you even do a business plan. The belief narrative saying, OK, one year from now, if everything goes the way that I dreamed it to be, what would my life look like? And then writing that narrative from that perspective, you know, and then looking at what are the themes that pop out from there, because that'll help to sort of direct you. And where can I sink my teeth in to create a vision that I actually can get behind and want to execute on? Because the challenge is going from ideas to execution. Ideas are nice. But if we don't execute them, then we're just very much in the same place we've always been. Nowhere. Right. Execution is what gets us tangible results. So the business. So if you start with the belief narrative, that is like the all the cuddly, warm feelings. Right. And then the, you get into the business plan where you're like, OK, what is the mission of my business? And this is just sort of a very general template. You know, what yeah. is the purpose of my business? What are the sort of competitors of the marketplace? What do they offer? How am I different from that? What This is the danger word for millennials. What is my niche? <clears throat> you know, niche is scary because you have to like say, all right, I'm only working in this area. And that's scary because you're committing to something. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it long enough, if you think about it creatively enough, you should be able to identify a niche that you actually really care about and that you're jazzed about in your particular area of business. Whether you're an inventor and you're like, you know what, I'm creating products for stay-at-home moms, or I'm creating products for millennials, or I'm creating products for, you know, college students or whatever. And that doesn't mean that people that aren't in that target demographic or that don't meet the criteria of that niche aren't going to also want to use your products. It just makes it easier for you to know who you're talking to, know who you're advertising to, know where your people are hanging out so you can meet them and offer them your product. And that's all things that you would do in a more traditional business plan, you know, like a SWOT analysis and, and all those kinds of things. Um, 
that may sound scary, but really, if you think about it, it's just like writing a double spaced 10 page paper. And it's easier than a double spaced 10 page paper because you just fill in the blanks. You're just filling in, you're plugging in the answers to the questions that are already there. It may require you to do a little research. It may require you to do a little soul searching. But once it's there, it's a living document. It's not this Bible that we're afraid of that we can never change and blah, blah, blah. It's this thing that we can go back and we can change and we can say, you know what? I thought I wanted to have a business that was on focused on one-to-one coaching or one-to-one physical training or one-to-one consulting, but I actually... I uh, want to work with bigger corporations or I want to have a course online course business or whatever. Um, and you can go back and you can modify that. Yeah. I listening to this, I think this is already going to be really helpful, but I would even say, so two things I would even say that like for people, not even for a business, but just for your life, this is really handy to know what it is you want to, you know, the type of person you want to be in the life you want to create um and uh what what it is you stand for and all that kind of stuff i think that's really helpful too and um you know your values and all that stuff so so you make sure all the decisions you're you're making are aligned with what it is that you want to create Uh, but then strictly on the business side i think especially for people who are trying to build a side gig while they're still at their normal job this is probably really helpful when you don't have a lot of time, like we spoke about earlier. You know, if you only have like an hour in the evening, it's going to be really helpful to know like this is what um, my business stands for and what I'm creating. And so these are the these, the steps I can take in this one hour every evening um, to move towards that. Uh, so I think that's really important. What are some of the, the pitfalls when people are becoming an entrepreneur um, and how do we avoid those? Oh yeah. So there are three, in my opinion, of course there are more than three, but in my opinion, there are three main pitfalls that entrepreneurs face when they're first starting. One is sort of self alienation, right? Which is like, Oh, I'm, I'm making this thing. So like I have to crawl under a rock Or I have to like be by myself doing this thing at the computer 12 hours per day. That can lead to the second pitfall, which is loneliness, right? Feeling like no one else understands what you're going through. You're also physically by yourself because you have alienated yourself from everyone and all the fun things in your life because you're like, well, I can't go to this barbecue because I need to like spend another three hours at the computer if you happen to be of the old school thinking like busy is good. I'm of the new school thinking that busy doesn't necessarily equal productive, Mm -hmm. you know, and as we've already established, I'm very big on personal balance. So for me, you know, the alienation and all that is very dangerous because you're throwing yourself out of balance in a big way, which makes sense why suddenly you'll feel lonely And then the loneliness can lead to a lot of self-doubt, a lot of insecurity, which is the third big pitfall, because, you know, you're by yourself, you're physically alone, you're not talking to anyone about what you're doing, you're not, you know, following, you know, to, to quote Abraham Lincoln, one of Lincoln's lessons to get out and circulate amongst the troops, whether it's your friend, your family, or your target demographic, to actually talk about what you're doing. And the self-doubt can lead to a a very downward spiral of of just like, what am I doing? Should I be doing anything? Then that then makes your productivity, you know, plummet. And then it's just a very bad cycle. You're like, oh, I'm not doing Mm -hmm. enough. So I have to continue to alienate myself. You continue to feel lonely and, you know, depressed for lack of a better word. And then it just feeds on itself and feeds on itself and feeds on itself. And honestly, Not to sound like a broken record, but making sure that you even do little things like schedule in time for yourself, for your family, especially if you're in a relationship. Do not underestimate the importance of just spending like an hour on the couch with your partner, just watching TV or watching them cook dinner or whatever. Like you need to take time away from the work. (laughs) All of this, these pitfalls come from just being too 
in the work. Like if you are so in the work that like that's all, that's your whole existence, like you are headed towards burning out in no uncertain terms. Yeah, I'm laughing here because my girlfriend would probably kill me if I said I just wanted to watch her make dinner. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it is a very real thing. And I struggled with it a lot myself. I probably still do, to be honest, in in always thinking there's something else to be done and like not really celebrating what I've already achieved. Um, and it, it like I don't know if it's especially because I'm kind of a first generation entrepreneur, if you want to call it that, or self-employed. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I... I definitely relate to what that feels like and you know always needing to spend more time working on it and like putting in 14 hour days and um it, it like you said it becomes this this kind of vicious cycle that you struggle to get out of um but i think my my girlfriend living with me now has, has helped a lot because i you know i can't just be on my laptop all day um, yeah and i mean don't get me wrong i'm not saying that there aren't going to be days where you mm-hmm spend 14 hours at the computer or you spend whatever. But even in those days, you know, give yourself a lunch break. You step away from the computer, like walk around the block, you know, FaceTime call your mom or your niece or, you know, watch a nature video for 10 minutes or something. But even during those days, it's important to stand up, get some water, you know, walk around and, and give yourself the opportunity for your brain to like take a beat and come back to it. It's like anyone that trains for athletics, for example, runners. If you look at really successful runners, they do interval training. And you might be like, well, they can run 10 miles without stopping. So why are they running three and then walking for a minute and then running another three and walking for a minute and blah, blah, blah. It's because the body responds to that one minute rest in a way that is exponentially beneficial to the health of that person so that that next three miles feels like the first three miles. And that's the same for your brain. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask you about something that you mentioned in, in your email to me. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. And that is experimenting with kind of like, uh, little projects and um, that kind of thing, exploring different little side gig opportunities. And you mentioned how, you know, we can use small scale projects to create large scale growth. And um, whether that's like for goal setting, for success or um, making a pivot in our careers, I'd love for you to speak about uh, this process of using these small projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And so actually this plays perfectly into, for example, this person that's working full time but wants to create a side hustle and they've built out their vision, Mm -hmm. right? Let's say they have their little sort of rough draft business plan. Um, These small projects and will actually not just help you build large scale growth, but it'll actually help you build momentum to transition if you want to make this your full time gig. Right. And the way that you can go about doing that is by identifying what are the things that a you have the resources to start to go after. So if you're a service provider, let's say, um, let's say you like want to do a massage business or something and you're you already are a certified masseur, but you're working for a spa or something. Right. If you just take the time to start putting yourself out there to land one or two private clients here or there, right? That's not like creating an advertising campaign or like doing Facebook ads. It's nothing big. It's just creating a business card, giving it out to people here and there, landing one or two clients. Those one or two clients refer to someone else. Now you have four clients, five clients, six clients. Now you're like, I don't need this spa gig anymore. You know, you use that time to create a website that small project of creating the website. Now you have an online presence. So now people that have not been referred to you find out about you and are coming to you. So it's all very incremental. You know, you identify what is the lowest level of entry that's going to use the resources that I currently have, the skills that I currently have, and where I can make some sort of potential, where I can take some sort of action that would result in X outcome. And you start there and then you look from there. Okay. How can I build on this? 
who can refer me or, or where can I get my product next? You know, if you have a product, for example, I have a client who creates these uh, votive candles that are very cool, super millennial, but also have like a spiritual aspect. And she started on the online space, just creating a separate online persona with an Instagram and a, and a hashtag. And through that, created an entire network of people who order from her and buy them. And through that, was like, okay, now I'm going to see if I can put them in some little mom and pop gift shops, you know? And then through that, is now taking that internationally. So Amazing. small scale projects. And this started as a project from her while she was in business school. And that now is her full time business, you know? So small scale to large scale. And having that vision that you build out over time. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like, it's really good to have the vision, but that doesn't mean that you have to start. Like, you know, it doesn't mean that you're a failure if you're not starting there. Um, so I love the idea of starting with the resources you have and where you are. I, I don't want to let the interview go by with, and I see we're screaming through time here, but I don't want to let the interview go by without giving you a chance to speak about um, your two Facebook groups. Uh, well, one Facebook group and your mastermind group. So why don't you share a bit about those with us? Oh, thank you so much, Brian. So I have a 100% free Facebook group called the Success Suite, which is a place where I share success tips and offer a little weekly challenges and resources for career professionals, entrepreneurs, and business owners who are looking to be in uh, a space with other growth minded people who are looking to create this sustainable growth, but also maintain this personal balance. So all of the people in there, you know, either own their own business or they are some upper sort of level person at a company or have their own entrepreneurial endeavors. And I use it as a place to remind them of certain things. Like for example, one success tip is create, professional alliances, you know, or exercise. That's one of the ones for this week. Exercise is important to be successful as we've already established. Um, I also share information with them about other individuals, like for example, Todd Herman, who right now, I don't know when this is going to air, but um, the cart for his 90 day year is opening on June 12th. And this is a program that um, it helped me increase my year to date sales from last year to this year by 500% from January to June. Um, and he is a high, he's like the best high performance coach you've never heard of that works with like athletes and C level executives at fortune 100 companies. Um, and so I share information with them about him and from his program and from other programs. And so it's just a great free resource for people who might say, you know, coaching, I might be interested in that, but I don't really know a lot about it. Um, who are you and what are you about? It gives you an opportunity to like get to know me and the process there. The mastermind is for individuals who and we've already sort of launched and closed the one for this cycle, but there'll be another one launching in the fall. It's for individuals who already have a vision, right, but need help with accountability. They need help saying, okay, these are the tasks that I put ahead of myself, but I need to like have some people to check in with. I need a squad. I want some people that have my back. And so this is sort of a way to to get in with people and do some of that accountability without feeling like you have to do the whole coaching thing because maybe you don't need that. Maybe you don't need that one-to-one, -one, you know? And then of course I offer the one-to-one -one coaching where that takes an individual who sort of has an idea of what they want to do. They know where they are. They know where they want to go. Um, we explore where you don't want to end up. We explore making sure that they identify for them what is success because it's important that we're operating from that as opposed to like what they think society is makes successful because you're never going to be happy chasing that. Um, you're never going to feel fulfilled. So we start out immediately by identifying, okay, what is success to you? What will help, you know, what, if you reach that goal, will you say, damn, I did it. Um, and that's where we work from. We create a strategic plan and I act as an accountability partner to really put the blocks in place to get you there. And that's that. Um, aspect. And then for those of you who are like, 
you know, I work too hard. I don't need any coaching, but I just need to get away because I work too hard. I do do international wellness excursions. Um, and my next one is coming up in October to Cuba and it is all inclusive. Um, now for those of you that are internationally listening, we have an opportunity to amend the package if you're going to fly from wherever you are to Cuba. But for those of you who are in the sort of continental U.S. or in North America, um, if you just get to Miami, we take care of the rest from there. Amazing. And we'll link up all of that in the show notes. Uh, well, I do want to be mindful of the time, but before we wrap up, I've got some quick fire questions. The first one is, what do you wish you'd been told in your 20s? Uh, I wish I had been told that I could be successful without having to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest opportunity for quarter lifers today? Um, creating your own business because there is the lowest barrier of entry right now than ever before. But that comes with the caveat of making sure that you know what it is that you're trying to do. Mm, yeah. I have one final question before I get to it. Where can people go to find out more about you and the mastermind group and everything else you've got going on? Absolutely. You can always find me at awilderivera.com. That's www.awilderivera.com. I'm also on Instagram at miss.awilderivera, on Facebook, awilderivera coach, yogi, spiritual advisor, and LinkedIn, Awilda and Rivera. Amazing. And as I said, I'll link that all up in the show notes so people can find it really easily. Uh, well, that, before I get to the final question, I just want to take a second to acknowledge you. Um, I did mention it early on, but I'm going to just bring it back again at the end here for realizing that the thing you thought you wanted when you were younger and even growing up was not actually the thing that you know you felt you could contribute the most in. And for taking a step and changing that. And, um, you know, I think it's really bold and really brave. Not a lot of people would do that. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge you for, for taking that step and for helping others do the same now. The final question that I have is what one thing can listeners do this week to start creating their own quarter life comeback? That's a great question. Um, the one question, the one thing that they could do is they can ask themselves where do I feel like I can be more fulfilled? What part of my life could I be more fulfilled in? Be really honest with your answer about it. You know, that's part of it. Like really being honest with yourself, even if you don't like the answer to the question. And then taking a step to do that. Taking a step to be more fulfilled. Mm. I love it. Wilda Rivera, thank you so much for coming on the Quarter Life Comeback. Thank you so much, Brian. It has been an absolute pleasure. So there you have it, guys and girls. That wraps up episode 70 of the Quarter Life Comeback podcast. And a big thanks once again to Awolda Rivera for coming on the show and sharing a bit about uh, you know, her experience and her expertise on entrepreneurship and becoming your own boss. Shout out again to our sponsor today. It's Optimize. And if you want to get the best in personal development books and more distilled into short little nuggets of wisdom that you can absorb in 20 minutes or in six pages, make sure you check out bryantia.com slash optimize and uh, you can find out more about the amazing program they have going on there. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantia.com slash 070 and uh, make sure you subscribe at quarterlifecomeback.com to get all these episodes and even more goodness as soon as they come out. Thanks once again for joining me this week. And until next time, keep creating your quarter life comeback. Thanks for listening to the Quarter Life Comeback. Get started today by visiting bryantheer.com. 